I remember when, um, in 2002, when President George Bush made a State of the Union address, he referred to Iran as the axis of evil. That was Satine Tashnizi with the Emerald Project back in April 2018, sharing her and her family's personal experiences about experiencing prejudice and discrimination following the attacks of 9-11 nearly 20 years ago. The Emerald Project formed shortly after President Trump signed an executive order at the beginning of 2017, banning foreign nationals from seven predominantly Muslim countries claiming the measure was needed to combat terrorism. Welcome to our In Focus discussion tonight. In this show, we will discuss combating Islamophobia in Utah, as well as President Biden's repeal of the Muslim ban. But first, we start with the formation of the Emerald Project. Joining us live in studio now is Nora Abu Dan, who is the co-founder and chief operating officer, and Satin Tashnizi, the co-founder and executive director of the Emerald Project. Ladies, thank you so much for being here tonight. We look forward to the conversation. Thank you for having us, Rosie. We're so excited to be here. Thank you, Rosie. Let's start with you, Nora. What prompted the formation of the Emerald Project? So honestly, it was a need to just finally get up and make a change and stop talking about it. I remember Satine Faiza and I were sitting on my apartment living room floor and we just kept hearing rhetoric about we got to figure out what's going on with these Muslims. They're dangerous. They're terrorists. And for once, we just didn't want to sit around and, and just talk about it. So we had a three part series called Is Islamophobia Real? And the rest is history. I love that you guys took matters into your own hands. Satine, what would you say your organization's objectives and goals are? Yeah, so we formed as a reaction to the Muslim ban. And as you know, it's kind of challenging when you react to a moment kind of in history, right? An executive order came in and kind of swept up the world. Um, our mission statement is to combat the misrepresentation of Islam. We're looking to prevent another Muslim ban from ever happening again. And that means we need to combat a lot of misinformation and unfamiliarity that led people to buy into, frankly, a ban that absolutely doesn't make any sense. I love that you guys are fostering a platform, a place for conversation about this. Nora, how big is our local Muslim community here in Utah? Um, so as far as the statistics, sorry, excuse me, the statistics go for that, it's about 60,000 people. Don't quote me on that, but um, we have a beautiful Muslim community here, not as big as some other states, but we are here and we do matter. Satine, did you ever experience Islamophobia yourself? If so, how did those experiences play into the work that you're doing today with the Emerald Project? Uh, that's a really good question. You know, not all Islamophobia is blatant and outwardly hateful. I think the bulk of Islamophobia that I experienced were in my college and high school classrooms. Opening up textbooks and seeing my identity so deeply misrepresented and syn synonymizing Islam and Muslim with terrorism as a student of Middle Eastern studies, I think was incredi incredibly disturbing. Um, how does that influence our work today? Well, I think it's, you know, there are real national security issues that this country faces, and framing them as Muslims is, I think, dangerous um, and harmful to both our identity as the United States and to our country who actually faces real problems. Nora, I'd like to direct this question to you as well. Have you ever personally experienced um, Islamophobic behavior? Yeah, I would like to echo what Satine said. It really was in school, and believe it or not, not just students, but teachers. A lot of times it would even be coworkers or managers saying that I can't have one of two celebrations off during work because, you know, it's surrounded by the lunar cycle. And so it's kind of hard to explain your faith when it's just presented in one negative light. So when you try to bring about different conversations in different topics, sometimes it's hard for people to understand and that comes out in Islamophobia. So just as Satine said, sometimes it is blatant and it is on purpose and other times it's just out of pure ignorance and people not knowing. Mm -hmm. Nora, what type of audiences have attended, participated, or engaged in the Emerald Projects events? We've seen all different types of people and we're so happy about that. We've seen anywhere from the age of five years old coming to the Utah Museum of Fine Arts exhibit that we had, the Umma exhibit. We've had people coming who are in their 70s and 80s who support us, who want to know more about us. So everything in between and Muslims and non-Muslims, we've seen a variety of people and I think that's because they really have the appetite 
to want to get the answers and to hear the truth and our narrative instead of what everybody else says about us. Mm -hmm. As I was combing through all of the photos from your events on social media, I saw that you've spoken at the FBI. I've seen that uh, Salt Lake City Mayor Aaron Mendenhall has participated in your panels. So we're talking about everybody, right? <laughs> Muslim, non-Muslim, politicians, community leaders, which is great. So Satin, how tough or um, how difficult do these conversations get at your events? That's a good question. Um, I think because people are in so many different places, we've had conversations anywhere from people who are kind of shy and you know hesitant to ask some of the tougher questions at our event, kind of apologetic, all the way to people who have like straight up walked out of our events before. So it's quite a wide scale, um, but thankfully something that Emerald Project is expert at is facilitating an environment to have safe dialogue and conversations. In order to have these difficult conversations, you have to get uncomfortable. That's yes. how we make progress. Nora, I want to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. How has it impacted your organization? I know that a lot of your events were panels and discussions. So have you had to adjust so that you can continue the work of your organization? Definitely, Rosie. We've had to make huge adjustments. We went from in-person dialogues and programming, like you said, to literally having to re-strategize everything and seeing how we can still have conversations and campaigns and really reach an audience whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim but now virtually. I think we weren't the only ones who had to put ourselves in the creativity box but thankfully social media has been a great tool that we've utilized. Um, you know pre-recording events and streaming them live on Facebook and on YouTube so uh, it's been challenging for sure. We'd be lying if we said it wasn't but it's challenged us in a way that in, it, it's almost given us a bigger reach, right? We just had an event with an author who is in Chicago, but we were able to facilitate a conversation mm -hmm. uh, just by doing it over Zoom. So mm -hmm. thank goodness for our social media platforms yes. and our streaming services. All right, Nora and Satine, hold that thought. We have to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we'll resume our conversation on combating Islamophobia in Utah. I would be called Al-Qaeda or terrorist. That was Faiza Javed back in April 2018, talking about her personal experiences with hate, discrimination, and prejudice while growing up in Utah, simply because of her Pakistani background. Thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on President Biden's repeal of the Muslim ban. In our last segment, we were introduced to the Emerald Project, a local nonprofit organization with co-founders Nora Abudan and Satine Tashnazi. We now move to the subject of combating Islamophobia in Utah. Now, Nora, some people don't know or understand the difference between the terms Muslim and Islam. Could you explain that to us and are the terms interchangeable? That's an excellent question and I know a lot of people struggle with this and it's not even malicious in intent a lot of the time. So as a Christian is to Christianity or a Jew is to Judaism, a Muslim is to Islam. So when you're talking about the people belonging to the religion, you would say Muslim. So I'm a Muslim, Satina is a Muslim, and we belong to the religion of Islam. That's a great explanation. Now, Satin, Islamophobia in the U.S. didn't start with President Trump's Muslim ban in 2017. It's been existent in our country for quite some time. What were some other events that you can think of that contributed to the mistreatment and discrimination of Muslims? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think, you know, especially after 9-11, there was a lot of otherization and Islamophobia that came out of that. You know, when something tra as tragic as September 11th, like an attack on U.S. soil happened, we need someone to be a culprit. And unfortunately, sometimes that's not the time to be able to really understand some of the key differences between the terrorism and ideology that fueled the actions of 9-11 and the peaceful religion that is Islam. And so I think a lot of people, you know, one needed someone to blame, and so they turned to Muslims. As you remember, after 9-11, a lot of Muslims were pulled out of cars and beaten, you know, pretty pretty badly. Um, and I think those misunderstandings were never really truly rectified, and there was no real um, incentive for people who didn't know to find out. 
there are real consequences to that when when you blame mm -hmm. someone for something even in modern day thinking about the COVID-19 pandemic and people calling COVID-19 like the China flu and the hate crimes that increase against Asian Americans there's always a consequence when we blame a certain demographic of people for something now Nora your organization works to combat the misrepresentation of Islam what are some of the most common misconceptions or misinformation that you hear a lot of misconceptions that I hear is that, um, you know, women are supposed to be forced into marriages, which is not the case. A man and a woman both had to have to agree to be married to one another. Uh, a lot of times that I hear that it's okay to kill ourselves within the religion when that is one of the major, major sins that you can commit. You cannot take your life. Um, even though on the news and sometimes in the media it's portrayed that, you know, jihadists belong to Islam and they say that it's okay to blow themselves up. And I've heard that one a lot in our events. Um, some other things that I hear too is that honor killings are okay and that's simply not the case either. So just a lot of things that are fueled by what people may see in TV or in movies or in the news or in media. I think everyone has just kind of put that all in a box and say this is what Islam is instead of going to a Muslim and really hearing what the truth is. And that's why that face-to-face -face interaction with the person who's actually Muslim is so important. You have to go beyond what you see, right, in modern culture. Uh, Satine, as with other cultures, the Muslim culture also has a lot of differences from the American culture. What kind of challenges or issues do Muslim Americans face growing up between two cultures that can be so different? Are there any culture clashes? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, Muslim is a religious identity. Culture usually stems a lot from like a racial or ethnic background. So for example, I'm an Iranian American who also happens to be Muslim. And so that is a lot of conflicting identities. I think to grow up seeing your identity demonized on TV and on the news and in media and in just, you know, even in your classroom, that's incredibly challenging. There's a lot of pressure to feel like I have to pick one. And frankly, the most beautiful part of the United States, I think, is this idea that you don't have to pick. Um, but I would say that's probably the biggest issue is, is pressure to, to you know, discount one identity because it's you know, demonized over another, which I think is, is really tragic. And on that note, what are some of the challenges, issues, and barriers that our Muslim community still face today? Satine, you can take this one. <laughs> oh, um, thank you. That's a really good question. I honestly, there's a lot of different challenges that we face. Our Muslim community is incredibly divided. Um, we you know we, you know, we, especially in the United States, I think a lot of our parents immigrated here and there's not a whole lot of communication between different, like Muslims of different backgrounds. And so building those bridges between Iranians and Arabs and Bosnians and Malaysians and Indians and Pakistanis is I think one, one major challenge. Um, another one I would say is also for us, you know, like Nora and myself who were born in the US of trying to navigate who we really are, you know, to be Muslim and Iranian or, or Muslim and Palestinian in the U.S., you know, it takes a little bit of deliberate effort to really understand who you are and be able to save, you know, feel safe in that identity. A Muslim ban makes it incredibly unsafe to be who you are um, in this country, and I think that's a huge challenge for first-generation Americans. Yeah, it's a challenge for anybody, right, who has to navigate between different cultures as well as religions. So Nora and Satine, hold that thought. We have to take another quick commercial break. But when we return, we'll resume our conversation on President Biden's repeal of the Muslim ban. This is family separation by another name. Mothers can't be assured that they can be at the bedside of their dying children. That was Delaware Senator Chris Coons and Minnesota Representative Ilhan Omar back in April 2019 when Democratic lawmakers prepared to go toe to toe with then President Donald Trump to reverse the travel ban that they say unfairly targeted Muslims. Welcome to our third and final in focus discussion tonight on President Biden's repeal of the Muslim ban. During our last segment, we talked about combating Islamophobia in Utah and the challenges that our local Muslim community still face to this day. We move now to President Biden's repeal of the Muslim ban with Emerald Project co-founders Nora Abu Dan and Satine Tashnizi. Satine, circling back to the Muslim ban that we had in our first segment, could you briefly explain what President Trump's Muslim ban was that was enacted in January of 2017? Well, frankly, 
Um, what Donald Trump said on TV on the campaign trail is we need to quote unquote ban Muslims from entering the United States until we figure out what the hell is going on, implying that Muslims were a national security threat that led to terrorist attacks like 9-11 um, and other terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. What it actually in reality was was an Islamophobic executive order that was meant to feel Muslims feel unwelcome. Um, and unsafe in their home country of the United States. Seven countries were on the on the ban list. Um, if you look at like the you know trends of national security threats and what actually happened on 9/11, why those seven countries were randomly selected doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, but its consequences were incredibly pervasive. Nora, how did the Muslim ban impact those living here in the U.S. as well as those living overseas? Yeah, that one's a really tough question, Rosie, because I can't even begin to describe how so many people told me how they felt. Um, at the time, I was working as an Arabic interpreter for Catholic Community Services, and I worked with a lot of Syrians and I worked with a lot of Iraqis as well, both of which were on that list. And to just see the horror in their eyes that they don't know when they're going to see their family again, because a lot of them were still in Syria or Iraq. so. To see something that was put in place out of fear, something so hasty, something that put all Muslims in one box, and it didn't matter if we were separating families, it didn't matter if someone was wanting to flee religious persecution, which is what this nation was allegedly founded on. People come here to breathe freedom. They come here as refugees and immigrants. This is what created the United States to begin with. And to see that the seven Muslim majority countries we're not welcomed, we're split up, we're having to deal with the ban because of who they are and what they believe was really, really disappointing and heartbreaking. And I can't even begin to imagine the actual feelings they went through having been those countries affected because me just as a Muslim, my heart goes out to them and my heart was broken. Now this next question is for both of you. Um, I'll start with Satine. One of the first things that our new president Joe Biden did in his first week of office was repeal the 2017 Muslim ban. What was your organization's thoughts, feelings, and response to that order? Yeah, so I mean, I'll start with when the ban first originally was passed, I actually broke down crying at, at work because I felt such a deep feeling of rejection by this country that I love so much. And, you know, it's been a long four years of waking up every morning with a Muslim ban active and around. Um, our lives move on, but the Muslim ban was continued to be there. Um, I actually just came back from Washington, D.C. I was outside the White House when President Biden was signing the executive order to repeal the Muslim ban. Um, and I'll tell you, it was such a surreal feeling to, to be there knowing that that repeal was happening. Um, I felt a little bit of reassurance knowing that, you know, maybe not all acts of rejection and discrimination in this country are permanent. That being said, you know, from an organizational and personal perspective, our work isn't done. At the end of the day, we live in a country where a Muslim ban survived for four very long years and it took the pen um, of a brand new president to repeal that. And that's extremely concerning to me. So at Emerald Project, you know, our goal is to combat the fear and unfamiliarity and the core mis misinformation that allowed a Muslim ban to ever exist. Nora, what about you? Um, it feels amazing because to wake up and originally have all of those countries listed and feel, as Hatine said, rejected or betrayed by your country, but now knowing that you can be reunited with your family, now that you can start processes to uh, visit your home country if you haven't been there in a long time or for people to come here, I think it's something that was much needed and it shouldn't even happen in the first place. So we are looking forward to this administration and what's to come, but again, it's an ideology. So it's not just one administration or one person's fault that led to the Muslim ban. I think a lot of people had that same sentiment. I think a lot of people were scared of Muslims and are still scared of Muslims. Mm -hmm. So that's why Emerald Project is still around because we're going to those root causes and those root feelings and those root thoughts that really led to this and make sure that it never happens again. And that way, when you do judge a Muslim or somebody on their faith, it's because of their character and not what they believe. Ladies, we are really enjoying this discussion, but we are running out of time. Real quick, before we wrap, uh, Nora, how can our viewers find you or connect with you if they're interested in more information, uh, connecting with you or attending one of your future events? 
Thank you, Rosie. Um, they can find us a number of ways. They can go to our website, www.emeraldproject.org. You can follow us on Facebook. We are Emerald Project. Uh, Twitter, we are at Emerald underscore project or on Instagram at Emerald Project SLC. All right, you've been hearing from Nora Abudan and Satine Tashnizi, co-founders of the Emerald Project. Ladies, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. We really need more of this conversation around this topic. Thank you for an insightful discussion tonight. Thank, thank you, you, Rosie. Thank you, Rosie.